Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? It is good to be with you all today. Um, it is such an honor just to be here, just to be able to share uh, the Word of God with you all today and what the Lord has laid on my heart. And um, uh, just, we're, we're praying for you guys up at Marysville. We're praying for this church, uh, just, a, just a good spirit in here. Uh, just, it's very good to just be here today and uh, we will continue just to pray for you all in your search of a, of a shepherd and, um, and just this church that it continues uh, just to thrive and preach God's word. And uh, just a little bit about me. Um, oh. Hang on. Oh. That's all right. I'll, we'll, just, we'll do the nods, all right? Um, so just a little bit about me while they're getting the slide pull up. There it is. All right. Um, a little bit about me. So I actually grew up in a Christian home, but before that, uh, my parents actually were divorced shortly after I turned one. And, um, but my mom, uh, she, so they got divorced, and then my mom, a, a few months later, uh, met my, my stepdad um, at a singles retreat. Um, my dad met her and said, I'm going to marry you. And my mom was like, you're crazy. And they ended up getting married a couple months later. Um, so they've been married. Uh, they got married in October of 97, I believe. I was born in 96. So um, very short turnaround. But, but uh, my stepdad is a very great man of God. And he's, he's taught me a lot of, of who I am today. And uh, so, as I said, I grew up in a Christian home. And I, I could tell you, I, I prayed the prayer many times, right? I, you know, God save me, you know, I'm a sinner. Right? I, I, I prayed those so many times. I went to the Christian camps, and I would pray that prayer. But I never really got it. I never really understood what that meant. And um, actually, in sixth grade, I came to a point where I really did not like coming to church. I did not like going. I did not like listening to the sermons. I didn't like the worship. I was annoyed, really, with church. And... Um, and my, I think my parents kind of sensed that. And so the summer right before my eighth grade year, my parents said, hey, um, if you read the whole New Testament this summer, we'll buy you a new phone. No. Right? Isn't that a sweet deal? So even with a kid with poor motives of wanting to get a new phone, I read the whole New Testament, and that changed my life. It really changed my life, just in the sense that, that the Spirit um, started coming out within me. Um, and so I, I really started reading the Bible every day. I'm um, actually known at school as like the, the Christian kid. I was, I was that kid at school. Um, I, they called me uh, Rev uh, when I, in sports, right? So they, they all knew me as the Christian kid. Um, but there was still something missing um, in my walk of faith. Yeah, I was reading the Bible. I was praying. Um, but I... I just felt something missing. And so I actually went to uh, a live festival. Has anybody heard of the Alive Festival? A few people? All right, cool. Um, I like to call it the Christian Woodstock. Um, I, I think it, it like best describes it. It's a big music festival in Atwood State Park in Ohio. And uh, it's awesome. But the year I went, it was like rain and mud everywhere. So that's why I like to call it the Christian Woodstock. It was just uh, messy. But it was an awesome time. And one of the speakers there was David Nasser. And he was talking about his wife and how she was uh, always just like just really good girl, just, you know, just always said and did the right thing. But there was something missing in her life. And it, it was that, that full commitment to Jesus in a pursuit and a relationship with him. And at that point, that's when God really spoke to me and said, you need to do that. And so right then and there, I confessed and I gave my life to Christ in pursuit of a relationship with him. And so that's, that was the summer right before my sophomore year. Um, and so that's when I really started seeing this teaching thing become a passion in my life. I was uh, a peer tutor at my high school. I helped out with kids with any uh, range of subjects. And I really loved that. Um, something in me, I just loved helping people. And so uh, I also had a great math teacher who inspired me to want to teach math. And so um, I, was actually, I actually went to Bowling Green um, uh, Darren said that he went to Bowling Green, too, so a fellow Falcon, hey? Um, but it was cool that, that I had that opportunity to be able to go there and, and learn how to be a teacher. Um, but actually, the summer right before I left for BG, um, I did 
three weeks in a row of helping out my church. I went to our uh, it was, uh, junior camp, which is our third through fifth grade. I was a camp counselor for that. The next week was beyond camp, which is sixth through eighth grade. And the week after that, I did a VBS. Three weeks in a row, I helped out just as a volunteer. And I just wanted to just help out in any way I could because um, I was never able to in the previous summers because I was playing football. And so it was, it was tough for me to do that. So, um, and that's when I realized that I loved helping people in their walk of God. And so I ended up going to BGSU. I got really involved with a, a campus church up there called H2O. Um, and during the summers while I was up at BG, I come back and I was an intern. I was a youth, in for, youth intern for two summers at, Bowling, or at Marysville Grace, and I was a pastoral intern for a summer. And now I'm currently a resident at Marysville, which is uh, I'm going to seminary and also working in the church. Um, so working to become a pastor. Um, and actually during my time at college, I got engaged too. So that's my fiance uh, in the first two pictures. Um, and so um, we're getting married in June. So very, very close. Very excited about that. And um, also part of my residency, I went on a trip to Canada. So that's all of us uh, in the corner there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that trip later. But, and before we get into our content, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just are so thankful for you. So thankful for your faithfulness and just your good, God. And um, Lord, thank you for this church that they're just on mission and they want to um, proclaim your name. And uh, I pray for them that they may continue to do that. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So, uh, as you all know, we've been going through this series called Blueprint. And we've been looking at how God has designed the capital C church, right? So, this, the overarching church, um, so the people, the church, to operate. And so, specifically, we've been going through the, this first letter uh, to Timothy from Paul. And as some of you know, Timothy was the pastor at Ephesus. And um, as we've already read today, we're going to look at all of chapter 4. Um, and so, which in my Bible is, is titled Instructions to Timothy. And so our big idea today is... There it is. Here, there, okay. It wasn't on. That's on me. All right? So you guys are good back there. Uh, our big idea today is through Paul's instructions to Timothy... We as believers can be encouraged in our walks of faith. Through Paul's instructions to Timothy, we as believers can be encouraged in our walks of faith. And so we see this, I, this big idea play itself out in three different ways. Believers are teachers, believers are in shape, and believers are diligent. And so the first point I want to make tonight, today is believers are teachers. Right? We, just, we actually just sang it in that last hymn. Right? Teach us so that we may teach others. But let me clarify what I, what I mean about teachers. I'm not saying all believers are called to be up here giving sermons. Some of you might be. Some of you might be able to be called to that. Or maybe teaching a Bible study or a discipleship class or something like that. But not everyone is called to lead God's people through teaching, and that's okay. That's really okay. Because we each have our own part in the body. We each have our own role in the church. Right? Just how each of you have, have your own role in this church. And some of you might be really afraid of public speaking, right? Some of you might, oh, public speaking, right? It's like one of the top fears in the, in the world. And, but you might be an all-star at hospitality. That's your gifting, right? Your gifting is hospitality, to make people feel welcome, to, to bring them in and have them feel loved that, that this, this home that you bring them into is their home. So we each have our own gifting, but we all have one calling. And that's a capital C calling, as I like to call it, and that's a calling to be in a relationship with Jesus. Some might receive another calling, which I like to call a lowercase c, which is um, leading and shepherding God's people, but everyone is called to a relationship with Jesus, each and every one of you. And what I mean by every believer is a teacher is we look at Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them. Teaching them. 
And we need to be teachers specifically when it comes to the preservation of the gospel. Preservation of the gospel. Has anybody played the game of telephone? Right? So if you, if some of you giggled that yes you have, right? So it's this, this game where if you have a line of people and one person says uh, a phrase and then it goes along the line and then at the end you see either how well you kept it together or how messed up it got up at the end, right? It, usually it's usually messed up at the end. And I, I had this thought a few years ago while I was at an H2O service about this, this idea of, the, of preserving the gospel and how important that is. That as we pass it along from generation to generation, we have to make sure that we're keeping the gospel message true and we're preserving what it truly is. We don't want it to be like a game of telephone where you know, we tell one person that someone gets a little bit wrong and then the next a little bit wrong, a little bit wrong, and then at the end it's a different gospel than what we preached before. So it's our duty as believers is to teach the gospel in such a way as to preserve its true message for years and years to come. And we have to make sure we get it right now so that we can, so the next generation can, can get it right. And then the generation after that. See, so many people have different ideas of what the gospel is nowadays. They like to make up their own gospel. They make up God in their head, who He is, and uh, what they think He is, and, or how they go to heaven, or uh, what their purpose here on earth is. They make up so many different ideas about this that we have to make sure that we preserve the message of the gospel that it may not be saturated of its truth. If we look at verses 1 through 3, it says, The Spirit clearly says that in a later time some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. Such te teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. And then verse 3, it talks about some of the things they, they, this, these teachers force people to abstain from. And when I was reading this uh, in verse 2, it said that these teachers, their consciences have been seared. Now, I'm a big grill guy. I love grilling. Who's, who, anybody else like grilling here, right? A few people, right? I love grilling. I love getting that nice piece of meat and it's seasoned or it's marinated and putting it on the grill. Oh, I love grilling. I, could, I, I grilled this past week, and it was like raining and cold, and I still grill. I love it. But what's crazy is, right, so you open up the grill, and you get the, the nice, it's nice and warm, and you got your nice piece of meat, and you put it on the grill, right? And what, what sound does it make? The tss, right? That kind of like that searing. But what happens is once you put that meat on the grill, it's never going to be the same. That, that raw piece of meat has now been seared. It's been changed. And there isn't any way of going back. Right? And so this is how bad these teachers were. They were not leading people to Jesus. They had these thoughts of, of leading people in Christianity, but they had become so warped in their thinking that they weren't leading them to Jesus. And Paul says, he's like, where are, these, where are they getting these ideas from? Everything God made was good, right? In verse 4, it says, For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. May this be a caution to all of us how, how we teach people, that our hearts may not be seared, but that it may be for Jesus. See, the gospel isn't a message about a do this or don't do that. It's a message of hope. It's a message, it's a truth that it has nothing to do about what we've done, what we are doing, what we will do. It's all about what Jesus did. That's the gospel. And that we can be covered through God's forgiveness. Let's look at verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of good teaching that you have followed. So us as believers must teach in a way that we can ensure and preserve the truth, the true message of the gospel for generations to come. 
that the gospel doesn't get lost in translation like the game of telephone, and that we can pass it on to our family for generations and generations to come. So believers are teachers. Next one, believers are in shape. If you go with me to verse 7, follow along with me. It says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and life to come. So as I shared in the, uh, a little bit about me at the beginning, I went on a, a Canadian wilderness trip uh, last September. And in the lead up to the trip, there was a lot of physical preparation. We went to CrossFit um, every Sunday for about eight weeks. Uh, and then I was running um, during the week. And I actually went to the Marysville Above Ground Reservoir. Has anybody been there before? Um, maybe not. Um, but it's, but it's, there's a, a stairs that it's very, very tall. And I, would had, a, I had like a dumbbell. And I would run with that dumbbell all the way up, all the way down, to, just to prepare for this trip. Um, and just to give you a context of what this trip's all about, uh, we basically went up to Algonquin Provincial Park in, in Canada. And uh, we roughed it. We lived um, out of packs and no, no electronics or anything like that. We went up there and we basically roughed it, set up tents, all that kind of stuff for six days. Um, which I'm a city boy, so I have never really done any of that in my life. Um, so that was pretty crazy. Um, and we also portaged. Has anybody heard of a portage before? One person. Okay, a couple people. Okay. Now, a portage is when, so you have your pack, right? Your pack has food in it, has your clothes in it for a week, has your tent in it, has any other supplies from the group. And this is about 40 to 50 pounds, right? So there's these big packs on. You then put the canoe on your back, which is about 45 pounds, okay? I have a couple faces in here like, oh my gosh, right? So... And what we do, and you, you put it on, and you just go. Okay? Now, you go um, over rough terrain. Uh, the, the first night we were out there, it stormed, right? So there was trees over. It was muddy. It was cold. It was wet. Uh, it was unbelievable. Um, so the second day that we were there, um, so we didn't, we didn't portage at all the first day. We just paddled. Second day... Uh, we pad a little bit, and then we had our first portage. So this is my first portage ever. I have never even thought about having a pack on, having a canoe on, and, and walking in the woods. Right? So this is my first experience ever. And this first portage was 1,880 meters. So it's a little bit longer than a mile. Okay? So imagine up and down, left and right, with this canoe and your pack going for over a mile. And at the end of it, I was like, I feel pretty good. You know, 22 years old, feeling good. Like, this is, this is fun. Uh, I actually, it actually was fun to me. I never really challenged myself, in, like, physically that way before. Um, I was always, I played football, so it was like, run, 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 run. I never, like, challenged myself like this. And so, um, it, was, it was fun afterward. So then our, we paddled a little bit more, and then we had our next portage, which was 3,000 meters. So uh, almost two miles, and I was at the end of it. I was like, "I'm feeling it, but I'm, I feel good though. I'm feeling it, but I feel good." Uh, and then we went up to this observation tower. So this is the picture is up on uh, it's about a thousand meters up on this uh, big observation tower overlooking the whole park. Um, so it was very steep to get up there. So thousand meters up, thousand meters down. And we had lunch there. And it was very cool. Took a lot of pictures. Um, but that took a lot out of us, I realized. Uh, because on the last one, which was 3,750 meters long, that was hard. That was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life, physically. And there was, uh, on this one trail, there was a fork in the trail, right? So we, we're going on it, and I'm, I'm feeling good, and it's very flat, and it's like, a, it's like a cart path. You know, it's very nice. There was a fork in the road where you can continue on this nice cart path, or you go up on this one hill that's very steep. I got up the hill and I called it a death hill. 
if that gives you any context. This thing was awful, but it was such a great experience. Just to be able just to, to push myself physically. And I remember right in the middle of that, of that last portage, I was thinking to myself, I'm so glad I trained for this. I'm so glad I trained because I, I, I may have finished. I, I would have pushed myself to finish, but it would have been even harder if I hadn't trained at all. And so being physically fit and in shape is good. And right, so eating healthy, that's a good thing, right? Body is a temple verse. People like to quote that verse and to, uh, you know, having a good body. But what does the text say? It says, physical training has some value, but godliness has value for all things, for present life and eternal life to come. So what is this godliness? It's a spiritual health or you're, you're being like God, right? In verse 7, it says, train yourself in godliness. So we need to train ourselves to be like God. So how do we do that? We learn who he is. We learn who God is, his character and his nature. We ask him to change us so we can become more like him. Right? This, that's called sanctification. That sanctification means to be set apart for his work. That God is continually changing us from the inside out that we can be, uh, we can be made holy for his work. And finally, we can also pursue heavenly things and not earthly things. One of the things that uh, our leader talked to us about on this trip was flexing your spiritual muscles. And I was like, that's really interesting. And like, As I was thinking about that, you know, we face a lot, of, a lot of stuff in this life. Trials, temptations, sufferings. That makes life hard. And despite falling back into worldly things that give us maybe instant gratification but not a prolonged satis satisfaction. How can we cling to God? How can we flex those spiritual muscles that we've built up, that we've trained, that when we go through hard times, that we, we can cling to God, that we can say, I'm going to rely on God's word. I'm going to trust God in this process. I'm going to relinquish anything that I think that I need to make me feel better, that I'm going to give it to God, that He can Help me. That we can trust God. We can have hope in God. That we can deny ourselves. Saying no to what we want or what we think we need or what we think we deserve. Right? Isn't that so prevalent today? I deserve that. So I'm going to do this. I've worked for that. We must train to be in shape spiritually that we can flex those spiritual muscles. And so, f follow me here. When these Canada trips, when these quote-unquote Canada trips where you're pushed to, your, to the end of yourself, where you, think, you don't think you have any more, that you are prepared. When you have these heavy burdens for long durations or when you are in the midst of pain, that we are ready to endure that that we can flex those spiritual muscles and we can rely on God. That He can sustain us and help us to persevere. Because when trial and temptations come, it's a matter of when, not if. And we, when we are in spiritual shape, we can press on to Jesus. We can flex those spiritual muscles and rely on God. So first point was believers are teachers. The second point was believers are in shape. And last point is believers are diligent. All right, in verse 15 it says, be diligent in these matters. And so I was thinking, what is diligent? What does that mean? I looked it up and it says, having or showing a care and conscientiousness in one's work or duties. And if we look at verse 12, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Don't let anyone look down upon you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. 
I have a message to everyone in this room today. To the crowd with the many years of life experience, you know who you are. Young people like me want guidance. We really do. And it may not seem like it. We may think that we have it all together. But we want guidance. And some of you may not know the impact that you can have on somebody like me. Just in your wisdom and in your life experience. To the crowd of people that are my age or near my age, seek wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom and a lot of years in this room. Let's take hold of that. Let's take advantage of it. That we can be wise ourselves. And this ties into being diligent because we need to be diligent in our relationships. Because Jesus was all about relationships, right? Anywhere he went, he was talking with people. He was interacting with them. He, he was creating relationships with them. See, that's the cool thing about Jesus is that he's not a, a distant God that doesn't want anything, any, any part of us. No, he's a personal, intimate God. That he wants to know us. Dirt and all, right? The ugly parts of our heart, he wants that. He wants us. And so we need to crave the same thing, these deep relationships. And so to everyone, I, have, I want to say two things. For our relationships, we need to listen. And we're not just hear people, but listen to them. Listen diligently. Seek to understand what someone else is saying. What they might say might change your life. You never know. You never know what might happen when you listen to somebody. And I've seen it firsthand, the dynamic of a multi-generational church and multi-generational relationships and the beauty of that. That I can talk to an older guy and say, hey, what did you do in this situation, man? I'm struggling with this. I don't really know what to do in this situation. And he can say, Nick, you know, I, I didn't do it right all the time, but this is what I did. And maybe that will change my life. There's a sweet dynamic and harmony of a multi-generational relationship. And the second is this, be an example. Be an example. Be diligent about being an example. Doesn't matter how old you are, how tall, how short, where you're from, where you live, what your past, what your job is, doesn't matter. We all can be examples. We all can set the tone of being an example of setting the standard of, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus. Are you coming along with me? That's the standard. I want to strive for holiness because God said that He's holy and He's called each of us to be holy. That's the standard. And so we can be diligent in our teaching. We can be diligent in our spiritual shape. And we can be diligent in our relationship and our witness for Him. So remember our big ideas. Through Paul's instructions to Timothy, we as believers can be encouraged in our walks of faith. And so this is how we can be encouraged. This is how we can be encouraged. This is our application. We can be encouraged by being teachers. We can be encouraged by being in, in spiritual shape. And we can be encouraged as being diligent. So with teaching, with teaching, how, we can, how you can apply this is share your story with somebody. Share your story. Teach them the gospel. Preserve its message. Its true message. Second point of, of application is flex those spiritual muscles. Flex those spiritual muscles. Trust in the Lord. Depend on Him. Run to His Word when trial and temptations come. Say yes to Jesus and no to self. We need to be prepared spiritually for whatever God has for us. 
It might be a new job. It might be a new opportunity. Who knows? We need prepared spiritually, though. We need to be spiritually in shape. And finally, be diligent. Having or showing a care and conscientious in one's worker duties. Right? So having a focus of your worker duties. So I want to ask you, what is one thing that's taking you away from those worker duties? What's that one thing that's taking you away from being a good parent, being a good coworker, being a good believer in Christ? What's that one thing that's taking you away? Is it a, is it a sports game? Is it Pinterest? What is it? What way can you be more conscientious and have more of a care and be diligent in your roles and responsibilities? Going back to Blueprint and what this series is all about, right? God designed us and the church for a way, uh, a way for good, right? In verse 4, it talks about He created everything good. Just like how He created you to be good. All of us to be good. In verse 14, go down to verse 14 with me. It says, do not, do not neglect your gift. Do not neglect your gift. The gift that we all have is that we have an opportunity to impact people. We all have an opportunity to impact people. And Paul, I think it's so interesting, Paul finds it necessary to remind Timothy, a church leader, you would think he'd have it all figured out, right? you think that he would have it, that Timothy would understand that he has an opportunity to impact people, yet Paul reminds him. He reminds him to not forget the gift that he has. That everyone has a role to play. In this church, in this lowercase c church, but also in the global church. We all have a role to play. But we all have a purpose as well. Everyone has a role here in Marion, but we all have a purpose in the capital C church. The, the big church, the global church. Timothy... And the church people were not in Ephesus by accident. Timothy was not placed there by accident. He was there to proclaim the gospel and be an example for the people there. And neither are you. Being in Marion, you are here for a purpose. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your encouragement, God. That we can be teachers and in shape and diligent in your work. Lord, help us all just to be lights for you wherever we may go. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.